Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, lessons learned from taking SA banks and enterprises to cloud. Uh, my name is Jared Nordea. Um, I'm a cloud architect slash software engineer specializing in security and cryptography. I'm a certified AWS solutions architect and DevOps engineer. Um, uh, my Twitter handle is uh, at Jared Nordea. Um, I also do quite a bit of academic work in privacy and security, and I'm currently working on a number of papers looking at privacy and security in South, in South, of South, uh, South Africa. I'm also uh, working on a number of other uh, certifications. Um, I work for a company called Synthesis. We do specialized software development and cloud consulting uh, for the financial services industry. So we work with banks and other financial services institutions to help them build out their digital channels, online banking, credit systems, asset management systems, their market and payment integrations into SWIFT, BankSwift, the JSE, uh, compliance and regulatory reporting, as well as security solutions for card processing. Um, so five years ago, Synthesis started on its own uh, cloud journey, uh, trying to you know, figure out what the cloud is, how uh, we could benefit from it. About three or four years ago, we became uh, AWS partners. And then about two years ago, we became um, advanced uh, AWS partners. And then uh, we were able to basically show our competency in financial services with um, being able to build their systems uh, in the cloud. And we're also the first advanced partner uh, in Africa and the Middle East. So my talk today is the uh, combination of my own personal experience, uh, that of uh, my colleagues, friends, vendors, and uh, other people on forums. Uh, this talk is focused on AWS. However, a lot of the uh, content that I'm going to talk about today um, is, is, is actually applicable to the other cloud providers um, as well. And just keep in mind that this talk is focused on enterprises and banks. So when I say certain things, just keep that in mind. And then towards the end of uh, the talk, it's gonna, it's gonna turn a little bit negative because I wanna talk about some of the real problems that I have found in organizations when you actually want to implement DevOps. So when we look at the state of cloud in South Africa, um, a lot of businesses, small to medium and large enterprises are using cloud technology, whether they know it or not, in the form of SaaS applications, uh, Slack, Office 365, G Suite, Salesforce, Atlassian, the list goes on, on and on and on. And this includes both uh, sanctioned and unsanctioned applications. Uh, one of the vendors that we work with um, actually put some kit down at one of the big parastatals in South Africa and actually found that uh, they were using over 3,500 unsanctioned SaaS applications inside of that uh, uh, parastatal. That means that us, as the um, uh, uh, customers of this parastatal, our data is now being spread across 3,500 SaaS services without the parastatal actually knowing about it, which is quite a big problem. Um, when we look at public cloud, um, Amazon uh, Web Services leads the global market share. Um, uh, this is the global market share inside of South Africa. AWS actually has quite a, a larger footprint. Um, and the people uh, using Azure are mostly using it for Azure AD. So when you use Office 365 and you want to integrate it with your on-premise uh, identity management uh, uh, system, you have to use uh, Azure Active Directory in order to link it up to Office 365. Um, now, a lot of... Uh, banks, pretty much all of the banks, including a lot of the small banks, are all uh, uh, moving to cloud. So they all have cloud initiatives, and a lot of them have adopted a, a multi-cloud strategy. And all of those people that have adopted a multi-cloud strategy are actually failing at it very horribly. Um, they either pick one of the uh, those uh, providers and then they kind of focus on that, and then whatever's left over kind of gets split between the rest of the providers. Now, um, if you go uh, look at some of the thought leadership about how you do multi-cloud strategies inside of large enterprises, um, you'll very quickly find out that, uh, so what most companies try and do is they try and have the same set of philosophies and principles that they apply to all of those providers. However, you can't do that because the, uh, each provider's uh, way of doing stuff is different to the others. 
Um, and then I'll just mention that uh, regarding private cloud, uh, there's quite a lot of big investments into VMware, Nutanix, and Azure Stack. Uh, three banks are using Azure Stack. They absolutely hate it. Um, they would much rather prefer to use Azure Public Cloud before they will use Azure Stack. Um, and that also uh, it, it kind of relates to the hardware for Azure Stack is made by HP. And there have been five incidents that I know about where the, the uh, uh, a kit landed at the data center and it was DOA. So yeah, that's not great. Um, and then strategies that actually do work in a multi-cloud environment is where people have taken components of their systems and have split it across the different cloud providers. So in this example, there's an IoT um, farming application that one of the financial services have. Um, it collects data that goes into Azure. They then use AWS for data analytics, and then they, that goes into Google Cloud for reporting and forecasting. Um, and, and that application is doing uh, quite well. I don't know why they decided to go across three, three uh, providers, but that's how they decided to implement it. Um, and then just something to keep in mind is that banks are really, really investing large, uh, they're making significant investments into cloud technology. So this is one of our customers. This is a snapshot for the past uh, six months of their spend. And one thing to uh, keep in mind is that um, the overhead in this case was uh, it's around 33%. That means for uh, all of the money that the uh, teams are spending building stuff inside of AWS, um, about a third of that goes to actually securing the environment, all the enterprise licenses, etc. And the idea is that as the scales, that will go uh, down to 10 to 20 percent, and hopefully even less than that. Um, so I just want to dispel some of the fud that's around uh, cloud. So yesterday at one of the open spaces, um, the, it was mentioned that uh, people can't go to cloud because of uh, customer data. They can't be uh, moved outside of the country. That is absolutely not true. Um, the Reserve Bank have, has actually issued a guidance note and cloud directive about cloud technology. You are allowed to put customer data, including secret customer data, outside of South Africa, but you have to adhere to both the banks or uh, financial services uh, regulation. Um, and uh, if it's a high impact application where there's a lot of financial risk, both the, uh, the board of the bank and the reserve bank has to approve it before it can go into cloud. And then you still have to adhere to all of other regulations, including GDPR, POPI, et cetera. Um, so everybody's favorite question, when is the AWS region coming? So there is, there's no uh, formal announcement by AWS about this, however, Whenever they go to a new uh, region, there's a set of services that they have to land. And if you have been reading the news, the writing is a little bit on the wall, I would say. But uh, again, there's no formal announcement about this. Uh, Direct Connect and Edgefront is in South Africa. So uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to when they uh, announce it or when more news comes out about this. Um, so just to talk about some of the workloads in cloud already, uh, most of it is tier three, tier four applications. There isn't big tier one banking applications inside of cloud at the moment. Most of it is supporting uh, websites, information systems, corporate citizenship, um, uh, call center sentiment analysis, marketing campaigns, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, one of the applications that some of my colleagues wrote um, to assist with the uh, APSA, APSA divorce from Barclays PLC, uh, they needed to get rid of all of the Barclays branding, so they built a tool using SageMaker um, and a number of AWS services, so image recognition, AI, and machine learning, uh, that would go through about uh, two million documents looking for the Barclays logo, and um, then it would identify that, and then the system is going to be repurposed to uh, look for the old uh, APSA logo. Um, so some of the aspirational goals of cloud, when people want to go to cloud, they want to reduce the uh, cost, increase the agility, increase the innovation, uh, decrease their time to market, as well as improve their cost allocation to different business units, as well as increasing their visibility. Now. On the journey to cloud, there's a lot of wrong, uh, right and wrong decisions that can be made. And I spend a lot of time thinking of how can uh, my, myself as well as my colleagues uh, work with uh, enterprises to help them roll out 
DevOps principles inside of their organization. Um, so how can we hire smart people and then get out of their way so that they can actually uh, do what they uh, are paid to do instead of having to deal with all of this bureaucracy inside of organizations? So uh, in a lot of organizations, the reason why DevOps actually fails is uh, due to bad architecture, bad culture, and corporate politics, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. Um, so it is important to note that when you do go to a uh, cloud, you need to really understand a few uh, uh, cloud principles. So firstly, you need to make sure that the organization that you're working with is in the right mindset. They have, the, they have a good understanding of what um, cloud is about and, and they need to uh, get away from the on-premise mindset when they go into uh, AWS. And very, very important is that when you do go into cloud, is that you need to build your applications natively. So you should use the services that the uh, provider provides. So um, if you want to do load balancing, you should use an elastic load balancer and not spin up a F5 AMI to do load balancing. So many people do that. That is a signature of bad architecture. Um, and then again, uh, you know, encrypt everything and then kind of use the AWS well-architected frameworks to um, uh, make sure that you're adhering to uh, best practices and then automation plays a key role in that. Um, so I think most of you are familiar with this. Uh, the reason why we actually have DevOps so business, we go to the development or engineering teams, they will build stuff and then when they want to go into production in the legacy way of, do, of working, they would throw that over the wall, and then operations wouldn't be in a really good position to actually um, uh, support that application because they don't have the context required in order to do so. And w one of the big problems is because there is this uh, massive um, wall that they have to get over to go into production, very often in a lot of legacy organizations, they have... Um, uh, very frequent change windows where they do very big changes. So um, a lot of card systems, for example, they only do releases three or four uh, times a year. And um, basically the entire uh, division gets one day to do that release and each team gets about half an hour to 40 minutes to do their change. So you can imagine the stress that those people are under when they do that. And what we need to do in organizations is make sure that we can do smaller changes that get released more frequently so that if there is a problem, we can roll back that, uh, as, uh, we can roll back that change. And we can use CRCD pipelines to do that. We can also use CRCD pipelines to actually uh, again, uh, implement testing inside of those pipelines, but also implement security as part of those pipelines so that when uh, people go to production, we know that whatever they are putting there is gonna work and that it's secure. Um, now, one of the big things in order to have a cloud, uh, successful cloud migration journey is you need to use DevOps. And uh, one of the things in, uh, that you need to do to achieve that is actually have uh, immutable infrastructure. So if you're not familiar with the cattle versus pet analogy, uh, immutable infrastructure is, uh, you can see them as cattle, you can kill them off as you need, as you need to, and they can be replaced on demand and uh, versus the pets that we currently have in a lot of our environments when they are ill or sick, we nurse them back to good health. And this causes a lot of problems because um, uh, a lot of operation teams, they pretty much spend the entire time just fixing uh, these pets. And it's, it's really not nice for both the people who serve as um, it is as well as them. It also means that you can't replicate your environments between dev, prod, QA, uh, et cetera. Um, and actually using immutable infrastructure also means that you can uh, roll out security patches much faster in addition to having uh, significant cost savings, innovation, and agility. Now, in the traditional model of high uh, availability, you would typically have two or three data centers um, and it would be work, it would work in an active passive uh, setup so that if production goes down, you would then switch over to your secondary or uh, third data center. Inside of AWS, uh, you can actually use three availability zones and then use an auto scaling group where you have one um, uh, instance of your application running. Uh, you might need to do 
more than one instance depending on what your time to recovery is. Um, but this can have significant cost savings for um, a lot of enterprises that uh, don't need um, uh, like that high availability that's, or that a tier one application requires. Most of the applications in a lot of enterprises um, are actually tier three or tier, tier two applications. So if it goes down for five minutes, it's not the end of the world. Um, and then obviously if you lose your uh, uh, an availability zone, it will come up in uh, the next uh, availability zone. And that concept is really, really important and that uh, speaks to having that cloud mindset that you need. Now, as you um, uh, go into cloud, you really need to understand dif the different deployment models that you can use. So you can deploy on traditional uh, instances or servers using Amazon EC2. You can uh, use containerization or even serverless. And if you are going to migrate from your on-premise um, uh, applications into the uh, uh, cloud, uh, you really do need to think about re-architecting at least part of your application to actually uh, use cloud um, techno uh, technology in order to really achieve the benefits of cloud. So as you start building out, uh, when you work in large organizations, there are various standards that you need um, for your build. So it obviously needs to be secure, so that would typically be benchmarked against the CIS standards, which is the Center for Internet Security. And then we would typically put a whole bunch of agents on side of those builds, uh, uh, something for security monitoring, privileged access management, common tool sandboxing, as well as endpoint protection and antivirus. And if you are building uh, these t type of images uh, yourself in your environment, you should also think about how you can make it easy for developers to actually roll stuff into production, make it easy for them, but also um, make it easy for them, but also at the same time making sure that it's secure. And that is uh, possible if you have uh, a well-formed model around this. Then if you are going uh, to containers, just keep in mind that um, uh, of the container security dilemma. So uh, on instances, we would typically put a whole bunch of agents to do security. Um, and this becomes a bit of a dilemma uh, when we talk about uh, containers because where do you put those agents? Do you put them on the host? Do you put them on the container? Or do you do it in both? And um, I work with a lot of security people and nobody agrees on this. Each person has their own opinion about this. Um, our kind of final result is that we put it in both the container and on the host because um, there are unfortunately a lot of, I don't want to call them stupid, but there's a lot of people that do cowboy stuff um, and uh, you basically need to protect the rest of the enterprise when you do this type of stuff. Um, and then obviously really drive home the point of CICD uh, in, uh, when you create your containers. So regarding serverless applications, um, in our environment uh, with one of our customers, we are having, uh, we have about 5 million uh, invocations of Lambda uh, that runs for about 1,000 hours per day. And uh, at the bottom, this is just a snapshot just to show you something that when uh, you, uh, so our logging in this serviceless application is very verbose. And what happens is, is that goes to CloudWatch and then uh, CloudWatch, the logs is actually more expensive than the actual serverless function. So if you are going with serverless, just make sure that you, you uh, keep these types of things in mind. So one of the other things when you go to cloud is uh, you need to understand how the operational model um, that you are going to use. So um, uh, a lot of enterprises on premise, they have a whole bunch of tools and when they want to go to cloud, they often want to move those tools into cloud. However, a lot of those tools are not really cloud native and they can cause a lot of problems. I can give you an example. Uh, a lot of enterprises use InfoBlocks to manage their DNS and uh, IPAM. Um, but InfoBlox's license is tied to the underlying hardware. So if you put it in AWS and that instance, uh, something happens to the underlying hardware on AWS, you would actually then have an outage because then you would need to request a new license in order to bring that instance up. It's a bit of a, a, a really bad situation. 
Um, and, and this is really, really important. You need to, uh, especially for security monitoring tools, uh, you want to be, enable your on-premise teams to have a single pane of glass about that environment. They shouldn't have to log into five to eight different consoles to see what's going on, especially, or, um, especially if you are in a multi-cloud world. And just to drive this point really, really home, like operational excellence will always be technical excellence. You can build the best architecture, the best golden horse for your organization, but if you cannot operationalize it and support it, it's not going to matter. Um, so when we start looking at uh, building next generation architectures, there's a number of tools that we can use to help us achieve this. So um, I'm a very big fan of Cloudflare. They are a really, really awesome service. They provide WAF, CDN, and a number of other services which I haven't included there. Um, but what you can do with Cloudflare is now you can have a single layer across all of your environments, uh, whether that's on-prem or Google Cloud, AWS, Azure, etc. And then you can also have fell over between there so that if one of those go down, you can then bring it up. And then what you can also do is uh, on AWS, you can also load balance between your regions if that's something that you require. Um, and it also happens to be six times faster than uh, AWS's Route 53, so that's a better customer experience. Um, and then also the HashiCorp suites of uh, products. Um, so uh, Nomad had some love yesterday. Uh, I'm a very big fan of uh, Terraform, and these products support multiple platforms. So again, have one single layer that your operational teams and your development teams can use in order to use multiple uh, cloud environments. So when we start looking at infrastructure as code, um, there are a number of ways to create resources inside of AWS. You can use the console, you can use Ansible, you can use Chef, PowerShell, etc. However, when you use those scripting languages, it's not really re reproducible and those tools don't track the state of uh, those resources. Now, you can use CloudFormation, but uh, good luck. It's not easy to learn. And especially when you have immature teams that you're trying to um, uh, take them to cloud, it is quite a, a, a big learning curve for them. So what we recommend to our clients is for them to use Terraform. It's very easy to learn and it supports multiple uh, cloud providers. And again, it speaks to that point of having one single layer across all of your platforms. Um, and then you, you have one set of syntax that you can learn and that you can then um, expand on that. So everybody's favorite subject, change management. Um, so ITIL was created to um, help ease change management, although a lot of people think that it's evil. I'm kind of in the middle. Um, I think, you know, if you go through this, you know, ITIL is a little bit evil. It, it has a little bit of a bad reputation. So inside of um, organizations, uh, traditional, <laughs> um, traditional change management is typically done with uh, ServiceNow, but a lot of uh, us in enterprises, we call it service never because it's a terrible tool to use. Um, uh, you know you have a problem with your change management when it takes 30 to 40 times longer to actually create the change than it does to actually do the change. Then this also talks to responsibility, right? So um, you need to trust your engineers when they need to do changes. And not every little thing needs to have a change against this. And this is something that a lot of big enterprises and banks can't wrap their, their heads around. Um, and so the model that we are trying to push our clients to go for is um, if it is a low impact change and you have the skills, experience and certification, you should be able to do changes through a CI/CD pipeline without any change approval. If you are going to make a change where you potentially are impacting other uh, teams, then you go through the formal change control process. And the reason this is so important is because um, if you are too strict on change control, you're really not going to see any change in your environment. And uh, for those teams, they kind of think that change management is basically there to actually stop changes from happening. So AWS provides uh, quite a big uh, uh, suite of tools that you can use. Each of those tools have their own risks and um, constraints around them, and you need to really understand what those uh, constraints are. Um, uh, some, uh, some 
services like Elastic Beanstalk, really bad idea, please don't use it. Um, <laughs> Um, but that is geared for the more kind of immature uh, uh, teams versus the more mature teams. And w one of the big problems with AWS is like S3 buckets get a lot of bad rap because uh, not only is it quite easy to misconfigure S3 buckets, but it can also pose a massive risk to an organization where teams put data inside of that um, S3 buckets. Uh, yeah. And then the... Um, then the question is uh, to us, how do we then uh, actually prevent teams from uh, creating buckets that are insecure? Now, a lot of uh, banks have a network diagram that looks similar to that. Uh, they have their on-premise infrastructure with a transit VPC where a whole bunch of VPCs in different accounts are connected. Um, and then the, it, it, it basically comes down to how can we prevent people from harming themselves? So. Um, how do we give teams inside of AWS the freedom to do what they want to do without posing a massive risk uh, to uh, the business or themselves? Um, and in this example, uh, a team actually spun up an instance uh, to do um, AI and machine learning and forgot, they left it running, forgot that it was on, and uh, at the end of the month they had a $22,000 sticker shock. Um, and this is what I'm, and, and, and there are uh, controls that you can use inside of AWS, such as service control policies, to prevent those teams from uh, harming themselves. Now, one of the challenges that we often face with organizations is that the, they don't want to put the foundations in to actually uh, do DevOps correctly. So they want DevOps and all of the good things that it can bring, but they're not willing to spend the time or the money to do so. And then what happens is, is uh, they start building stuff inside of uh, AWS, and then they get to a point where there's so much technical debt that you can't really do changes because you never know if you're going to affect uh, anything else. Um, and, and then there's also... Um, yeah. And then, so, one of the uh, challenges that we have is how do we do scaled learning inside an organization? So one of the uh, techniques that we have found that works really, really well is uh, actually this concept of pattern. So a pattern is a document that tells you how to use a specific service, and then there's also a, code, a, a piece of code that goes along with that pattern. So when you want to spin up an S3 bucket, you use our module and it will make sure that the policies are correct. And then we can use uh, governance lambdas to actually make sure that you are using the policies that we say that you uh, should use. And what this means is that you can have uh, one repository inside of your organization where people can go grab different architecture components. It also means that they can move very, very quickly. And uh, teams can also then create their own patterns for other teams as necessary. And when you start getting into the um, notion of doing this, you can really um, uh, see really good progress inside of your organization. So some of the uh, operational challenges that we have found is um, you really do need the cooperation of a lot of teams inside of the organization. And a lot of them are practicing Wagile. So if you, a Wagile is, uh, Agile, that's basically waterfall. Um, <laughs> so, and so, you know, they, 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 do, they, they do waterfall, they have stand-up meetings, and now they're doing Agile, right? Um, and what's really irritating is when they don't do Agile properly, um, us that's basically doing project work, uh, we, need these, we need to work with these people, but because they have such... Um, bad stuff happening inside of their environment, there's all of these fires that are constantly burning and they never get any time to actually make improvements to their environment. Yeah. And then just to, uh, in closing, to talk about some of the culture problems. So one of the things that uh, I have personally experienced multiple times, I've seen business units at banks. They see problems. The engineers invest their time in uh, trying to rectify that problem. And then they have uh, a CIO or some other uh, executive in another business unit basically come shut down their uh, innovation. Um, so corporate politics inside of the large organizations is a really big challenge for uh, getting stuff done. And the end result is this, the uh, engineers who uh, 
a lot of time work overtime because it's a passion project of theirs. They leave the organization and then there's the skills gap that that organization is left with. And there's a famous uh, saying at Netflix that uh, uh, they constantly ask where they get the engineers from and it's like, well, it's companies like this that treat the engineers like crap. Um, so a lot of organizations, they want to be in cloud, they want to use DevOps, but they're not willing to uh, invest the time and uh, uh, money needed in order to, to do that, as well as they're not, they don't think of the journey that they need to take the organization through. And on that sad note, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions? I'll take the first one. Where can I send the beer to say thank you for promoting Terraform? <laughs> Jared. Um, I'm assuming as a bank you deal with quite, or working with banks, you see quite write heavy applications, which I think many of us are kind of on the read heavy side. Um, so for us, scaling is quite easy because we can just throw out read replicas. How have, or have you seen any problems like that with very write heavy big data applications? Then how do you, how do you scale that out? Because the multi master setup obviously can be a bit of a, a pain. And Amazon, I don't think, caters for. Multi mass, not that not, not that you really want that, but I don't think it caters for that natively. Um, so I personally haven't seen applications like that. I do know the guys building the Alk stack had some uh, issues with I/O, where basically because uh, uh, it handles I think like three or four hundred million events per day, and um, they basically provision their IOPS that. Uh, um, the end result of that was very expensive, so uh, they basically increased their nodes in order to um, uh, to deal with that. But uh, I don't know if that really answers your question. Maybe also just check with the AWS engineers. I think Aurora has got a multi-master either out. Someone nodded the back. Is it out yet or not? Preview. I think it's. Uh, it wasn't preview, but it might be out officially. Yet. Let me chat to them. Hi, that was a really good talk. Thanks for that. Um, do you know of any big banks or enterprises that right now are sort of exemplary in their doing the cloud? Like, is it, are there any outstanding examples that you can sort of point us to say, like, they're doing it really, really well? Um. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I will say that um, some of the banks that are just starting on their journey, they're getting a lot of stuff right, so I'm hoping uh, that they that they will be the shining star. The ones that are already in cloud, uh, they have so much technical debt in their environment that it's going to come back to bite them in a few years' time. Um, good talk. I want to ask you how hard is it for you to take a decision for a small size enterprises uh, to work with open source offerings like OpenStack? Uh, they can't afford to work with AWS or GCB or other offerings that aren't free. That's an interesting one. I think you. You could, I mean, you could use those tools, but then uh, at some point in the time, you're going to have to, uh, there's going to be investments that you're going to need to make in order to make things work, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Cool. Thank you very much, Jared.